Could you send an officer over here? We have a son that uh, has schizophrenia, uh -huh. and he's, he's not doing very good. Because we made that phone call, our son's dead. A call for help for a mentally ill teenager ends tragically. Never, ever treat sure. mentally ill people like this. You would just have a seat right there in the car. Mentally ill people are increasingly coming in contact with law enforcement officers. I mean, it's daily. Mostly because of our state's mental health reform effort that was supposed to move patients from its large hospitals to privately run community-based facilities. Money just never followed, and I think the, the, the ability to do good community treatment just hasn't kept up with the need. Leaving many officers who are well trained to protect themselves and others in situations they're not so well trained to handle. The traditional tools of command and control are really the opposite of what work effectively with people with mental illness. Some say officers need new tools, new training to deal with the mentally ill. You're asking police officers to be uh, mental health professionals, and they're not. No, I'm not here to take you to jail. I'm here to help you. But a new type of training is helping law enforcement officers learn how to help the mentally ill and themselves by avoiding violence and arrest. Taking them down to jail doesn't, doesn't help their issues or solve their problems. And solving problems is why people call 911 for help. But we gotta get it someplace. Keith Vidal loved playing the drums. He played in his church band. He was a good kid. He played soccer and video games. Keith was more of a jokester and daredevil. He was a lot of fun. A fixture in every family picture. He's in the middle of all of them. Yeah. He enjoyed <laughs> it. He was a real fun-loving little kid. But at 17, his parents noticed signs of paranoia. Kids were following him, you know, just worried about everything, didn't want to go to school because he thought kids were talking about him. Do you remember that? Mary Wilsey is Keith's mother. Her husband Mark became his stepfather when Keith was two. They thought Keith was just showing normal teenage behavior. And then it got worse and then she took him to the doctor. The doctor diagnosed him with schizophrenia. They take him in, they give him the right medication where he could function. He was doing good. You know, then he'd have a bad day here and there, but you know, in general, there was, he had no real serious problems. Until Keith had a bad day on January 5th. Can you describe a bad day for him? He was calling Mary, his mother, John, that day. He just, you know, didn't really, you know, in touch with reality. Finally, I made the call and told him we just needed help. And what is he doing right now? Oh, he wants to fight his mother, or he's got a screwdriver. He just, you know, he's not doing good. Okay. She's scared to death of him. Boiling Spring Lakes police officer John Thomas responded. He had been called to the home before and knew Keith. Brunswick County Sheriff's Deputy Samantha Lewis arrived about 11 minutes later. The Willsies say both of them simply talked to Keith. Just trying to, you know, to get the kid to agree to get in and let's go get help. You know, there was no, nobody threatening anybody, nobody felt any kind of danger. The Willsies say Keith was sweeping the floor and holding a small Keith. screwdriver in one hand. It was just his screwdriver he was keeping. Did he try to go after one no. of the officers? No. Then, Southport Police Detective Byron Vassy arrived. By then, Officer Thomas had been talking to Keith for more than 15 minutes and Deputy Lewis for almost five. And then when the third officer walked in, it was just, I don't have time for this, taste that kid, take him down now. The Willsey say Keith panicked, turned to run away, then turned back toward the officers. They tased Keith, he fell backwards onto the floor. At that point, the two officers got on top of him and was restraining him at that time. Detective Vassy drew his gun. And bang, he shot him instantly, killed him on the spot. And then turned around and walked out of my house like he put down a stray dog. That's not what we hire these people for. You know, protect and serve is the oath they take. That wasn't protecting and serving. 
By all accounts, Bassey fired between the other two officers. His gun was so close to Deputy Lewis that the shot ruptured her eardrum. Bassey shot Keith less than two minutes after he pulled up outside the Wilsey's home. I don't know if you've been advised or not, but shots fired. I've had to uh, defend myself against this subject. Bassey later told investigators he was not defending himself, but instead Officer Thomas. So I kept asking them, just please, is he alive? That's all I want to know. And um, nobody came back and answered me. My son died in that hallway. Vassie's attorney says Keith was charging officers with a pick, not a screwdriver, when Deputy Lewis tasered him and he fell to the floor. The officers tried to subdue him. Um, he was not, they were not successful in doing so. Uh, the uh, young man continued to attempt to stab one of the officers and um, in an effort to save uh, the life of Officer Thomas, um, unfortunately, Detective Vassie had to employ deadly force. Payne is being paid by the North Carolina Police Benevolent Association to defend Vassie. Its executive director says Vassie not only had a legal right to shoot Keith, but also a legal duty to when the situation became threatening to the officers. When that split second turns, it goes from uh, an effort to de-escalate to an effort to use the force necessary to stop the force that is being per uh, perpetrated against them and other people. But the Wilseys say it was Vassie who escalated the situation, which was under control when he arrived. Records of radio traffic show Officer Thomas and Deputy Lewis reporting everything was okay just seconds before Vassie arrived. A crime uh, almost certainly occurred, that this was quote unquote a bad shoot and that it needed to be put in front of a grand jury. In grand jury proceedings, David cited the SBI's investigation. It said Vassie told EMS workers, I'm here to kick ass and take names, as he walked into the Wilsey's home. He's been indicted for voluntary manslaughter. A jury will hear all of the evidence in this case and decide if Vassie was justified in shooting Keith Vidal or guilty of voluntary manslaughter. Regardless of the outcome, this case illustrates a much larger problem how calls to 911 for help with the mentally ill are happening more often. And it poses important questions about how law enforcement officers are trained. They train them to shoot and kill. But are they trained how to avoid that when dealing with mentally ill or mentally distressed people in crisis? What we're really asking for is help calming the situation down and getting somebody to the hospital to a bed instead of coming and shooting. Hey, how you doing today? I'm not doing well, clearly. Why are you Next, a new type of training gives law enforcement officers tools to defuse potentially dangerous situations with the mentally ill. Having this resource can make an officer that much better. And I find out how. You're just making the situation worse. Let me get the door, relax, quiet, quiet. No. I'm playing the role of a wife in a fight with my husband. He's been drinking. Hi, how you doing Hi. today? Good, how are you? Nancy State cool. University. Stop! And he actually does admit to having both a verbal and a slight physical altercation. This role playing exercise is part of crisis intervention team training. Hey, how you doing today? I'm not doing well, clearly. CIT training helps teach law enforcement officers how to de-escalate potentially volatile situations with mentally ill or mentally distressed people in crisis. You don't need to take that. Here, officers learn how to talk calmly with the husband. They find out he's a soldier who's just returned from his third tour of duty in Afghanistan. Person, but since he came back, all he does is yell. They soon suspect that his problem is much more than just drinking. After talking with him, they see signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. They have what they need to arrest him for an assault on a female, but it's going to be very clear to them that there's a person suffering from what appears to be an undiagnosed mental illness. So is jail going to be the right answer for him? Absolutely not. 
but the law does require us to take legal action in this case. That action is an involuntary committal to a mental health facility where the soldier can get the diagnosis and treatment he needs instead of going to jail. Good. Officers are also taught how to safely restrain people who refuse to cooperate. Just make a CPR type compression. In the week-long CIT course, officers learn about mental illness and how to communicate with a mentally ill person in crisis. You know, maybe being a little bit less authoritative, a little bit less controlling, a little bit less confrontational will actually give you more control of the situation. 170's birthday party. Mark and Mary Wilsey say that's a lesson Detective Byron Vassy could have used with their son, Keith. You cannot walk into a place where there's a mentally ill person and start yelling at them or barking orders. That you're going to tase them. Because at that point, they feel threatened. And they're going to panic. The more time you spend, the greater your success. In CIT training, spend, the emphasis you know, the is on de-escalating those situations. Uh, one of the hardest things I think about de-escalation is the amount of time that it takes. In the training, officers are told the more time they invest, the better the outcome. He's just a little guy there. The Willsey say Detective Vassy wasn't willing to invest time in their son. They point to standoffs where police will wait for hours for a suspect to surrender. I can't understand why my son didn't get that opportunity. I can't understand why you would come in here and purposely kill a child. who is mentally ill. You know, Keith ended up dead because the police didn't have time to spend with this child. I just try not to argue with him at all. I know he's angry. I know he's been drinking. CIT training is all about investing time. Having this training is just opens up more opportunities than what we had before. The reason more officers are taking CIT training is because they're coming in contact with the mentally ill more often. It's a side effect of the state's mental health care reform efforts that began in the early 2000s. The reform was designed to move the mentally ill out of large institutions like Raleigh's Dorothea Dix Hospital and into privately run community-based facilities. As we divested services, we divested things we may not should have, um, and we did not uh, build the robust community system that we intended to. The Willsies say they experienced that shortage of community care for their son, Keith. It was hard to find him the right help. And every place you turn, it's a dead end road. A few days before the shooting, the Willsies say Keith's psychiatrist wanted him admitted to the hospital, but the hospital would not admit him. They just sweep it under the rug. Nobody wants to do anything. And then you see what happens. It's left up to law enforcement. Three days later, the kid's dead. For my safety and yours, I am going to place you in handcuffs. Okay? The lack of inpatient treatment for the mentally ill is not only hard on patients and their families, it's hard on law enforcement officers, too. All right. If you would just have a seat right there in the car. It's becoming um, more of a, a a problem now than ever. Brunswick County Sheriff's deputies have logged nearly 1,100 hours transporting mentally ill patients to hospital emergency departments and from there to mental health treatment facilities. We frequently drive five hours to a treatment facility, so that's an, a challenge in itself. Deputies sometimes have to wait with patients in hospital emergency departments until a mental health treatment bed is available. Just recently we had to sit with a person at our local hospital for three days waiting on a bed to open up across the state. That's about the average wait time for a mental health bed in North Carolina emergency departments. And sometimes patients spend that time in jail. It's much more expensive to take care of someone in jail or in prison than it is even in a hospital. Um, and it's even less expensive to take care of someone in the community outside the hospital. This year, the General Assembly appropriated $8.2 million to help create community crisis care centers for the mentally ill. It doesn't happen overnight, unfortunately. So, but I think we're making great strides toward that effort uh, to recreate those community-based services that we originally contemplated in the uh, mental health reform to begin with. All right, ma'am, we're here at the hospital. Okay. She's going to get you unbuckled. We're going to go on in. And 
Law enforcement officers are joining mental health advocates in calling for more state funding for community mental health treatment. They point out that about half of all incidents involving police use of deadly force involve a mentally ill person. And these figures are going to, uh, I think, increase rather than decrease and less our elected officials understand that they are not saving money when they defund these very important facilities for people that, that need them. Very good. I mean, I, I would say pretty spot on. I really liked how empathetic you were uh, with, with the victim here. Uh, Meantime, the North Carolina uh, chapter of the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill is working with the state's regional mental health agencies to coordinate CIT training for law enforcement officers. The aim is really to make sure there are enough trained people in every law enforcement agency that if you get a call that involves somebody with a mental illness, you can deploy or dispatch a CIT trained officer. My car got stolen. Oh, your car got stolen. Yeah. What kind of car did you drive, sir? So far, 26% of law enforcement officers in North Carolina are CIT trained. The Wake County Sheriff's Office was the first law enforcement agency in the state to adopt the training. The training doesn't help the officers just deal with someone who has a diagnosed mental illness. It, also, it helps them deal with people that are in a mental health crisis, uh, any kind of crisis. Go ahead. Brunswick County Sheriff says he plans to have all of his deputies and staff CIT trained within a year. His deputy, Samantha Lewis, who was talking with Keith Fidel before Detective Vassie arrived, is one of his CIT officers. Brunswick County's DA commended Lewis and Officer John Thomas for how they handled Keith Fidel. These officers, other officers, have been cleared by the SBI investigation, and they did everything right. And said he was stumbling around the street. And the Next, the story of a life that may have been saved by an officer's CIT training. It certainly could have gone uh, worse than, than, than what it did. Okay, so this is my son Keith's room and the Willsies push for CIT training for all officers. What we don't want is for another family to have to go through this. To learn more about a call for help and the challenges of law enforcement interactions with the mentally ill, visit WRAL.com and type WRAL doc in the search box. The officer coming down um, Acock Street. UNC Greensboro police officer Larry Armberger responded to a call from a fellow officer about a student on this street. He was standing in the middle of the street here, stumbling around, where he almost fell out in front of the officer's vehicle. That officer turned around to check on the student. By that time, he had already finished crossing the street, and we got him down here in the parking lot. When Officer Armberger arrived, the student was sitting on this curb. The individual was agitated over something. At that point in time, I didn't know, uh, but he was upset and agitated. Armberger had recently graduated from crisis intervention team training. He knew the student had been drinking, but his training helped him see more. What triggered me to, to thinking that there was something else in there is just by the way he was talking, the phrases he was using, uh, what he was upset over, he kept repeating. Instead of arresting the student, UNCG police were able to keep him safe until his parents arrived to help. Could have gone to a physical situation where use of force would have, would have had to been, you know, necessary to, to restrain him. Armberger credits his CIT training for helping him avoid that. Those individuals get agitated, which gets you agitated and gets you, everybody's worked up. And it takes a lot of self-restraint to, you know, to, to keep calm. They're not out to cause trouble. They're not out to cause harm to others. That UNCG student was later diagnosed with bipolar disorder. His parents credit Officer Armberger's CIT training for not only keeping him out of jail, but also getting him diagnosed and treated. They say it's why he graduated and is now doing well. So this is Keith's room. This is yep. Keith's room. Keith's little palace. The Wilsies believe that if Detective Vassie had been CIT trained, their son would be alive today. If you're trained, you don't walk in and, and just start it. You know, you, you, you're supposed to talk like the other two officers were doing. This is Keith here. 
Right now, CIT training is voluntary, but the Wilseys want legislation passed to make it mandatory for all law enforcement officers. They want that legislation called Keith's Law. My son will never come back, ever. But if we stop one family from having to do this, from having to bury their child, then it's well worth it and it's well worth the money. Was this his big love? This was his life, yeah. drumming. And the reason why they're broken is because he beat on them really, really hard. You got a young kid that was dreaming of going to California and being a drummer is in a box.